Welcome to In the Spotlight, where we get the chance to take a breath from the frenzied daily news cycle and delve into a Jewish question or conversation that deserves a deeper dive and can challenge or inspire us. I'm Abigail Pogrebin, and I am joined today by three extraordinary educators and leaders in the Orthodox Jewish world. Rabbi Sarah Hurwitz is the co-founder and president of Maharat, the first institution to ordain Orthodox women as clergy. She also serves on the rabbinic staff at the Hebrew Institute of Riverdale, completed the three-year Scholar Circle program at the Drisha Institute, and was ordained by Rabbi Avi Weiss and Rabbi Daniel Sperber in 2009. Rabbanit Devora Zlotchauer is Rosh Kolel and director of the Advanced Kolel Executive Ordination Track at Maharat. Devora has taught Gemara, rabbinic commentary, and halakha Jewish law for 30 years, including at the Drisha Institute, where she was head of full-time programs, and SAR High School, Hadar, and YCT Rabbinical School. And finally, Rabbi Dr. Aaron Lieb Smokler is the Dean of Students and Director of Spiritual Development at Maharat, where she teaches Hasidic philosophy and pastoral Torah. Erin received smicha from Maharat in 2018 and earned her PhD and master's from the University of Chicago's Committee on Social Thought and her bachelor's from Harvard. She's a recipient of the 2021 Jewish Book Award for her edited volume, Torah in a Time of Plague. That was a mouthful, but you all deserve literally hours more of introduction. Thank you for being here. Thank you, um, thank you Abby. It's good to see you all. Sarah, I want to start with you, and thank you all for letting me uh, drop the titles for the sake of our conversation today and efficiency. Absolutely. Um, let's start with Maharat, because believe it or not, some people still don't know exactly the gestation of your seminary and particularly what that word means. Can you start by defining it? Yeah, so Maharat is the first institution to ordain Orthodox women, and it stands for Manhiga Hilchanit Rochanit Taradit, which is um, a leader in uh, Torah and uh, ritual and leadership, and uh, which is really the definition of what a rabbi does. And uh, when we were coming up with a title for our graduates and for our school, we wanted it to be clear that it was a uh, ordination track for clergy, for rabbis, but we were nervous about language, and so we wanted to find an acronym that described the job rather than getting confused with titles. And when you say you were nervous about the language, for those who don't understand sort of how the orthodox world is structured or what some of the strictures, expectations, traditions are, why were you concerned about, why, why would the word matter so much? When I was first ordained, I was advised to stay away from any RB sounding title. <laughs> so anything that sounded like rabbi, rabbah, rabbanit, all of these words convey male rabbi. And uh, the Orthodox community wasn't quite ready to call women any RB sounding title. Now, women were already learning at a high level. They were even filling leadership roles. Um, some of us were pursuing the, these clergy positions in very private ways, but there hadn't been a, a, a many, there weren't many women who were assuming that title. Uh, and I think that we were correct that there was indeed a firestorm when um, my title became Rabbah. Um, and I don't know why, right? If the question is why, maybe it's fear, maybe it was fear of usurping authority from male rabbis. Um, maybe it was fear of um, this being different to what was traditionally done in the world. Um, but I'm still trying to figure out what the problem is, is because women have so much to, to offer and contribute and do in the world. And so you really have made history, um, and you did 13 years ago. There really was not a Orthodox rabbi, a female Orthodox rabbi before you? Um, I don't know how to answer that question. In other words, I think that there were many women who are pursuing private ordination. I think that I was the first who was also hired by a, uh, an, a synagogue and had a pulpit. Um, and Rabbi Weiss and Rabbi Daniel Sperber publicly ordained me. Um, and I think that that was maybe the slight difference, that it was a little bit more of a, a public position um, and role modeling what was possible for other women. And before we get to the pushback, because I want to delve into a little bit more, uh, Devorah, 
I love you because you're also kind of an historian of the arc of Jewish leadership. Just for, can you set the stage of what it used to be like? Let's, before Ma, there was ever a Maharat, before any idea that either Rabbi Weiss or uh, Rabbi Sarah had, what was the landscape in terms of what was available for women's leadership in orthodoxy? Um, so it really depends how far back you go. Um, but um, where I came onto the scene, um, in the modern Orthodox community, there had been some learning of Talmud and rabbinic texts for women, uh, mostly at a less advanced level, high school um, gap year in Israel. And there were starting to be programs uh, for women learning um, some in Israel, and there was Drisha Institute, which was founded in 1979. Um, I came to Drisha not in 1979, I came to Drisha, um, I think it was 91. Um, and the during the second year that I was there, um, we approached um, Rabbi David Silber, who was uh, the dean and founder um, of, uh, of Drisha, and said, we want a multi-year program, and we want it to be based on the model of what the men are doing in Orthodox rabbinical school. Um, and that was a very deliberate choice, and was also a very deliberate choice for it not to be ordination, right? In other words, for the curriculum, um, to be the same, but we were not prepared. The group was not as a whole. Um, there were some, uh, you know, differences of opinions within. As a whole, we're not prepared and not particularly interested in the title, position, pulpit work, or anything like that. We were seeking knowledge. And so the, the stage before the stage of women really taking on and, and fighting for that power um, is the stage of gaining knowledge, um, which was its own not simple battle. And before that, that didn't really happen either. And that was also something that happened privately. It was mostly the purview of rabbis' daughters, um, women who were born into certain families who had access. And, um, but it, there was, it was still something that in a very public and real way didn't exist. Um, and is the necessary stage for, for what happened afterwards to happen. And in terms of what, so for people who don't understand what the prohibitions were or mm -hmm. are for women's participation, whether it comes, whether it's reading Torah from the Bema, whether it's actually teaching Torah, where, where were some of the guardrails in terms of what women could actually learn and let's put leadership aside, but do with that learning? So that's a complicated question. You put a number of things yeah. together. And um, I think one of the things that's interesting to think about historically, sociologically, and in terms of the Jewish law aspect is how far can, how much do we tease these things apart and how much do they all run into each other? Um, and, you know, as a feminist, the power Peace also is absolutely in the middle of all of this. So, um, so when you I, say power, I want to understand what you mean by that, because that's a word that could get some people's back up. Well, I, I use it deliberately um, <laughs> because that's why I wanted to, to <laughs> sit with it for a minute. I um, appreciate that you are. Yeah, because I think we are talking about power. Um, you know, authority and power are, I don't see a, a big distinction between that. And I think part of what's been the undercurrent, and, and certainly Sarah has, has faced this head on, has been what it means to make structural change when it, when it involves leadership, which is who, who's holding the power in the community. In the Orthodox community um, in particular, because um, learning is such a high value and rabbinic authority is 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 really based in in such a fundamental way on knowledge um, access to knowledge and access to power are not separable mm. um, and even if I would you know I would I would I would argue with the term prohibition because I would say I I don't I mean it's a longer conversation but but Let's, uh, you know, on, on its basic level, even if there is no prohibition, it doesn't matter because access to knowledge and access to power come, come very close together. And just to, to finish this point up of what I think where some of the changes are, I think the argument that was made by my generation um, or many of my, uh, my generation was exactly in that was exactly what I was saying, which is we just want the knowledge. Mm. We're not interested in the power. We're not interested in changing ritual. We're not interested in blowing up the whole system. But of course, 
It does. <laughs> it, it does. Um, so the firestorm comes when it becomes more explicit. Right, right. But I don't think I would have been able to do what I did without the foundation of what mm -hmm. Devara and her contemporaries did. In other words, they normalized women learning on a high level. And so the next obvious step was being an authority on that law, being an authority on that knowledge. Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't have been able to even see that uh, if, if they hadn't established and normalized that level of learning. And I remember when I, I was lucky enough to interview you way back in 2010 when this was all happening, that part of what was emphasized, and this is where I want to turn to you, Erin, is that you were as learned, as expert, as rigorous in a way that it's, I think it was actually Rabbi Golub said when he interviewed back then that you had to be in a way the best of the best for this to even be palatable at all. And it still wasn't from plenty of people. So I want to just go to the rigor because you've been through this program probably most recently of just how hard is this Maharat um, kind of itinerary? Like it, what is required? What is expected? I know you were starting at a more advanced level than some others who, who begin kind of at, at ground zero, but if you can give a sense of what one has to master sure. to do this. Okay. Um, our curriculum is based on the traditional curriculum of smicha um, that has been around for quite a long time. Smicha that means, as ordination for those who... Yes, mm -hmm. as ordination. And um, what that means is a deep dive into Jewish law or halacha as a very primary focus. Um, over the course of four years, the students cover areas of uh, Shabbat laws and Kashrut laws and laws of family purity and laws of mourning. Um, it, where I come in, actually, uh, was not through that portal, so to speak, but um, I am not a, an expert in halacha, mm. um, but actually somebody who gravitates much more towards uh, more explicitly spiritual traditions. Um, when I got involved with Maharat, there was a hope for not only transforming who studied, but also how we studied. So in addition to that core curriculum of legal studies, we have also added um, two, two aspects that I'm involved with, and there's more of course, but um, one is um, the study of Hasidism as a, a, a I'd like to think primary part of our curriculum, but is at least a weekly part of our curriculum. Um, and also uh, what we call pastoral Torah. Um, all rabbinical schools uh, do train, we hope, in uh, people in pastoral skills. But we wanted to make the claim that the pastoral skills and Torah knowledge are not actually two separate domains, but are related to each other, and that the Jewish tradition could be mined for its wisdom with regard to pastoral events and milestone moments. Uh, mental health, mental illness, um, rather, so rather than export that exclusively to the domain of um, psychologists and clinicians, uh, we co-teach that or I co-teach together with the clinician uh, to try to keep this conversation uh, both you know, clinically robust and also thick with uh, Jewish Torah language. And very grounded, I would imagine, in real life yes. kind of instances and quandaries. So if one is going to be very kind of shot about it and looking at YU, you know, Yeshiva University, NYCT, Hovavei Torah, and your curriculum, is it mirrored? Is it similar? Or, or is it, I'll take that. what would you say? Um, we're the uh, new kids on the block compared to those other places. And so we had the ability to see, uh, look at other curriculums across the board, both at traditional schools and at more liberal schools. And the truth is, we built something that was, was uh, a yeshiva model. And so we wanted it to be high level uh, Talmud, high level halacha, Jewish law, and that is very similar to the curriculum at YU or YCT. Um, I think that hiring Aaron actually was something unique that we, we offered, which is uh, marrying that this pastoral uh, ability to really meet people where they're at with through the lens of Torah. Um, and it was also important for us to add a leadership element so that we're creating 21st century rabbis who really understand what our 21st century community looks like and needs. I want to go back to when things were probably toughest, <laughs> which is at the very beginning. Yes. Um, and again, because I was writing about it very soon after it happened, I just remember how 
vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> How vulnerable you were, and that there, you were actually kind of shell shocked mm -hmm. by how ugly it got. Um, and, and there's actually a, a quote from Rabbi, Rabbi Dov Linzer, who was the dean of uh, Avi Weiss's yeshiva. Um, he remembers that Rabbi Weiss, who really shepherded you through this, said to him, the way people are reacting, you would think I killed somebody. Mm. You also, I think, said either from the Bima during your ordination or afterwards, you, you paid tribute to Rabbi Avi Weiss and said, you have risked so much to stand behind me. Um, it is my dream that young Orthodox girls will be able to say when I grow up, I want to be a Maharat and serve in the capacity of female Orthodox rabbi. And that, that now doesn't sound as far-fetched as it did at the time. If you, if you think about 13 years has made a difference. Mm -hmm. But just to take us back to kind of the, the uh, I would say the maelstrom, <laughs> you know, when was this particularly most pressured for you? And did it make you waver and maybe reconsider whether this had been the right decision? Totally. Mm -hmm. um, I think the reason why I was shell-shocked is because when I was ordained in March of 2009, there's actually very little pushback. It was a, a very lovely, quiet uh, ceremony where people from the community came. It really featured other women's Torah and ability to teach. And uh, I was expecting there to be some controversy, but there was nothing. And uh, what the main point is that I was accepted as an authority and a member of our rabbinic team. I was doing life cycle events, people were turning to me for questions, I felt like a rabbi, I was treated as a rabbi, and I thought that was it. And then what happened is in 2010, just a few months later, uh, we decided to change my title to better suit what I was doing. Maharat's a great title and I stand by it, but we wanted to go back to that RB sounding title to help people understand that I would be the person at a cemetery who was officiating and it would be clearer uh, what my job and role was and I'd be able to do it better. And um, we just sort of quietly started calling me Rabbi Sarah. We didn't make a big announcement, but it leaked and uh, it, it got to the press and that's when the firestorm really began. Uh, and I just want to quote so you can respond. The Aguda, uh, which is, you want to <laughs> define it, the ultra, is it ultra orthodoxy's most authoritative rabbinic body? That's what I have written down, uh, wrote or said depends, publicly. Depends, uh, <laughs> depends who you're talking to if they're the most authoritative. <laughs> That's a very good point. Um, <laughs> these developments represent a radical and dangerous departure from Jewish tradition. What was the main pushback? as you remember it. So I knew in my heart and soul that I was Orthodox, I am Orthodox, and what I was doing was in line with Halakha. I knew that because I care about Halakha, I care about Jewish law, and in order to pursue this path, we had done, I and other rabbis had gone on a journey to make sure that this was aligned with Halakha. And so I knew what I was doing was legitimate. I think the pushback came in a discomfort with something new. Um, the language that was thrown around was, this is against Masora. Masora was, it means tradition. And I think it was the veil that people hid behind for saying, this is uncomfortable because it's not what we have been doing for so many years. And uh, actually, actually, interestingly, people, very few people were able to point to any concept within Jewish law that made it seem like it was forbidden. Um, it was much more cultural or, or this is not how it should be. And you asked if, if I wanted to take it back, yes. <laughs> in, the, in, in that firestorm, I was shell-shocked and I didn't wanna be the center of a firestorm. I didn't wanna cause the firestorm. You know, I remember in my office that phone call coming and the male voice on the other side said, you're destroying the Orthodox community. And I wanted to be a builder of the community. I didn't wanna, I didn't wanna uh, break it in any way. And that's when I really thought that I should retreat and I should uh, go back to a different title or just stay much more quiet. But I was also receiving letters from young girls who were saying, I feel seen, I wanna be part of this. I can see myself as a leader and a participant in the Orthodox community. And that along with the very core support that I got from my own community is what propelled me forward. 
you said, I am used to being dismissed. Um, <laughs> you were disinvited to teach Torah. You were asked to leave a Beit Midrash. Um, there, after teaching in another community, uh, a neighboring rabbi said, we will have something else to cry about on this Tisha B'Av, <laughs> which is a day of mourning. Just those, it's, those things are so painful to look back on. What do you think got you through? I knew it wasn't personal. Uh, I knew that none of those comments were made about somebody who somebody knew personally, or uh, it, it certainly wasn't personal to me. Uh, they were fighting against a concept and an idea. Uh, and I think I was really grounded in knowing that the concept and the idea time had come. Um, I have a deep connection with God. I felt like, you know, God was on my side. And I think that's what got me through. And I think that still today I have a, a vision that this is right and just and the, the way forward. Devorah, you again were at that point not quite where Sarah was, it seems, just in terms of your, what you were actually doing. If you can just explain for those who don't quite understand, one of the things I kept hearing about was this idea of both modesty and I, I don't know if that is what, what is the like, sort of proper sort of Jewish frame, but not the risk of having a woman stand up in front of people. What, what is kind of the Jewish resistance or difficulty around just a woman being in front of a congregation? Or am I getting that, framing that entirely incorrectly? Um. As one of the arguments, as one of the discomforts with women's leadership. You know, I would certainly agree with, with Sarah here. I mean, that's, uh, that's not an argument that we've accepted in the modern Orthodox community in a very long time. Um, and I think part of part of what you know what shows the lie of that is um, women just uh, attaining the highest levels in their professions, speaking publicly. Um, you know that's been going on for a very long time. I actually grew up in um, a community that was more to the right. I come from Pittsburgh, and I grew up in a Chabad community. I went to a Chabad school, and the outstanding leader of my community was a woman and she spoke publicly all the time. And she was the most authoritative person and everyone knew it. All the rabbis knew it. <laughs> yeah, there was kind of a, you know, she would, yeah, the rabbis of the school, but uh, you know, she would pay a certain homage to them, but everyone knew that, that she was the real power. So, um, and this was a woman who carried herself extremely modestly. And I don't think we've ever really seen a contradiction between those two things. I mean, you know, there's a way to be powerful and be modest. And it's when people in power are not modest that we have problems. So I, I think that's a red herring. Um, and um, I think, you know, but just even listening to Sarah again, just the level of courage that that, that takes um, to stand up there and take it and, and to, to, to stick to what you believe, you need those kinds of courageous people to do it. Um, I, and I also do think there's something about moments in time, right? And what is, when is the right time? It's like, you know, getting that, ex get, really finding that fine point where there's a possibility of change and being able to take that leap and make it happen. But before then it's, uh, you know, it's, the change is not going to occur. And um, just to interrupt, you, yes. you said in, in one speech, we've done a good job to educate daughters that they can be doctors and lawyers. But how do they see their Jewish life? And what do boys think Jewish women are? These oh, questions God. affect what our institutions look like and who we choose as leaders and role models. Yes. Wow. <laughs> that was when a good quote. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I feel like I've been I've been talking about that for a long time. Um, um, you know, I, uh, I remember writing something uh, quite a while ago, maybe 20 years ago, in which I talked about um, visibility being such an issue. And this was at the point where women had started uh, speaking from the Bima um, or speaking after Shul and just that visual, right? I just imagine, you know, sort of a little boy and a little girl looking up and seeing a woman on the Bima and that becoming normalized. Um, and what that does, like you're not even thinking about it, right? It's, it's, it's a sort of a precognitive stage, but, um, but those are how things, that's what leads up to change. That's, that's what, that's what creates the ground for it. Um, 
Yeah. So courageous people in right time. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, if someone was going to say, why do they, why do women have to, they, why do women have to be rabbis? They can do all these other things. They can be learned, they can get the highest degrees and, and mastery, but why do they need to have this title, this role? How would you answer that? Why not? <laughs> um, I find it, I find the question itself hard to actually uh, make and it's much not sense mine, of. But it, I'm asking on behalf of others. Who sure, I know, I understand that. Ask the question. Um, but it, it just, it seems to me that whatever our heart's desire or whatever we are kind of called to do, we should be allowed to do um, and we should be encouraged and celebrated for it. So uh, the rabbinate is like anything else, a place to actualize oneself and for those who are, uh, you know, who feel passionate in those directions, this is the avenue for it that we have culturally constructed. This is the place that we manifest our relationships to um, God, the Jewish people, etc. And have you personally encountered the kind of pushback or discomfort in your community or close to your community that you've had to field in some way or? No, um, I have not. Um, I personally live in a, a fairly liberal community. Um, I work at Yeshivat Maharaj, <laughs> um, so that is obviously non-conflictual. Um, I will say that um, I personally pursued an academic path before I pursued a rabbinic one, um, having grown up in a community that did not have women role models um, or women rabbis. It was not a path that, that I had considered, um, and yet I desperately craved Jewish learning, spiritual community, um, and so I had a kind of focus, and then I had a, a side gig, if you will, um, where I was in, in graduate school and then wanted, and then just taught, taught a lot of Jewish things on the side. Um, so this is perhaps a funny answer, but the pushback that I received is not the pushback of the um, religious right, um, but it was actually the, a question um, maybe from academic folks or people within the um, Orthodox community who had a question, I suppose, that's a little bit similar to yours, um, but, but um, motivated by a different uh, push, which is why be a rabbi? not because it's not due to you, but rather it's so obviously due to you. Mm. Why enter into a community uh, that doesn't make 100% space for you? You could be, have an authoritative voice on another podium. Um, you know, for do me, you mean conservative or reform, or do you mean not no, I'm, I mean academic. Academic. Ac <laughs> yeah, as a um, yeah. Why enter this fray and actually limit limit power, limit exposure. And what's your answer? Because I love it. <laughs> That's why. Yeah. And because um, I could speak for a long time about the limits of the academy, but um, because I love it. Yeah. And because I can. And that's why. <laughs> so I want to talk about troublesome Torah, because I know that's something <laughs> that you all, <laughs> um, or troublesome texts. And, and I, was, I was reading about the jar, the famous misogyny jar. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, which I just loved. Um, not only that that exists, but that Jeffrey Fox, who is the man on the on the block, um, who seems pretty wonderful, uh, who is one of your professors. You can tell a little bit more about him because he's been there from the beginning. But he also uses the misogyny jar. And sort of how do, how does that work? I don't know. Did it start with divorce? Was it divorce? I no. Savara no, okay. does not like the misogyny jar. Okay. I'll let her talk it, about it. No, but it's okay. Okay. Rabbi Fox. I'm glad we've, we've hit on a little bit of discord here. <laughs> You're all agreeing too much. Um, Tell us about it. Sorry. No, I, I think Rabbi Fox, who uh, both Aaron and Jeff were amongst the earliest uh, people we hired in, the, in almost the second year. And um, he, I think, understood that women needed a place, his students needed a place to put their angst and uh, their anger. And uh, he also wanted to keep moving on <laughs> in the, the learning, right? You have to 
turn a certain number of pages to gain the knowledge you need to gain that authority right. and that power that we've been outrage. talking about. <laughs> and he, he couldn't, he first tried to ignore it. He tr tr kept saying, let's just compartmentalize that or, or come back to that. Can you give just one example? Is it like Lot's, <laughs> is it Lot's daughters? I mean, give us one. So I would say it's more in the, in the world of, of Jewish law, of halakha, okay. specifically around the laws of Nida, which Rabbi Nidavara has, has taught most recently. Purity. So the Pur laws of family purity and using the mikvah and sexuality. Um, and, and the texts there are written by men about women's bodies. Women are the objects and the, and the subjects of the text. Um, they have very little voice. Sometimes the rabbis just get it wrong, like the biology wrong. Um, and, and when you're a, a, a woman trying to understand the, the uh, halakha, the law, on a topic that is about your body, but they are not taking into account your reality, that is that is harsh. <laughs> that yeah. makes a lot of us angry. And so uh, Rabbi Fox's idea to help uh, contain the anger, but allow it and give it room and space was to uh, put this jar in the center of the room. And every time there was a, a, a text that was just wrong or difficult to handle, somebody put a quarter in the jar and the jar got full pretty fast. <laughs> <laughs> and then what happens? Is it Sadaka? Oh, or? for sure. It goes to, a, <laughs> but it goes to, a, you know, a, usually a women's oriented. <laughs> sort Wonderful. Of. And I, li I like, before I get to divorce, like pushback, I, I want to hear why she doesn't like the jar, um, is just that I think, is it Rabbi Jeffrey Fox? Yeah. He at, at one point demurred on teaching Nita, and you said, no, you have to teach it. And I thought that was like a wonderful moment, too, because it showed that you're actually asking the man in your midst um, not to abdicate from, from these difficult things. Can you explain? Absolutely. Yeah, and I look. I think it's much better to have women teaching the text and being authority on on and bringing their their voice. And that's why Devara Rabbi Devara was such an excellent teacher. She was actually my teacher in mm -hmm. Devara on on this text. But I really felt that uh, Nida, which is about women's bodies, was also one of the pillars of what our women had to know in order to graduate. And just like they have to know Shabbat and the laws of keeping kosher and the laws of Nida, um, we couldn't opt out of teaching them and we had to also just normalize it as part of the canon. And um, it, it's no it's, it's not it's not more special or or less special than the other areas of Jewish law. And so um, as the main teacher at that time in those early days, he uh, he had to lean in. He had mm. to lean into his discomfort and to normalize um, this as just the body of halakha that that you have to know in order to be an authority. Yeah. Devorah, did you want to say anything about it since you're... It's your yeah. <laughs> so first of all, I'm very tempted to go into a Talmudic sing-song voice because there's another version of the story, which is <laughs> that, and I don't think it was called the misogyny jar, it actually originated in my class. Oh, I see. And it was initiated yeah, by was a student. That's what I thought. It does. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It was initiated by a student. We were not learning uh, the laws related to menstruation and mikvah. <laughs> That's See, what do I know? For. Uh, <laughs> the, the Talmudic debate right here. This is, this is what happens to the right. tradition. It right. gets corrupt. It's oral tradition. It's handed over. <laughs> um, and um, we were studying a, um, a tractate of the Talmud, which dealt, which, um, it's, it's a tough one to learn and to teach. I've done it a number of times. It's the first uh, chapter of the Tractate of Ketubot, and that there's a lot of discussion there about um, uh, virginity um, and, uh, again, women's bodies in a different way. Um, and one of the students one day kind of clopped on the table and mm -hmm. said, this is it. We are putting out a plate. It was a plate. We're putting out a plate. And when something comes up that we don't like, we're gonna put money in it and we're gonna give it to a women's shelter. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're gonna do. And then of course, um, well, um, so sometimes I would overdo it just so that I could keep hearing like money Dang. dropping, <laughs> dropping, dropping, dropping. Mm -hmm. um, but we're, um, 
Jeff and I had the disagreement, and it's only right to call him Jeff if we're going to yes. be called by our first names. Where Jeff and I had a disagreement is when I um, taught last year, um, and he said to me, and first of all, we were on Zoom because of COVID, and he said to me, oh, I'm going to set up like a misogyny <laughs> channel in Google Classroom for us, and I said... <laughs> Uh, no, you're not. <laughs> um, and did it happen anyway? What? No. Okay. No. Yeah. Abby, I got to do Yeah, I, I, <laughs> if I say it's not going to happen. It's, it's not, not going to happen. happen. Okay. Um, <laughs> so at least not. And I was like, you want to have your own job? Right. Job? And but, but just that's from the, from the yes, yes, but so from ten thousand feet. The, from ten thousand feet, I'll tell you exactly what the issue was. I want those conversations to happen in my classroom. I don't want them to mm. be. I don't want them to be put aside. Part of, part of how I want to teach this material is I want it to be confronted directly, and I want it to be woven in. And and it's you're not of, and you're not leaving it out. And I'm not leaving it out. And you're not changing very very changing. deliberately. And I want, um, and I want the women's experiences to be in there. I want everything to be in the room. I want sex education to be in the room. I want... I, I but want I want to be clear for people, yeah. you are not talking about changing the law. Correct. You are not talking about not living by the laws of NIDA. So you're still in that tension. Absolutely. But see, but... Right, so... Um, and those could be demeaning to many people if they heard them. I yeah, I was, I, was, I was told this morning by, I was giving a, a, a guest class um, for, uh, for one of our programs, and someone said to me about something I had said, and they claimed there was no, that there wasn't psychological coherence, and I said, well, I'm, I don't do psychological coherence, I do incoherence. <laughs> so, you know, for me, um, living in that tension is exactly what it's about. That's what it means to be a um, true to halakha, traditional, modern, feminist Jew, all at the same point. And I want all of that air, there in the classroom. I don't want it siloed. Um, we need to talk about it. We need to grapple with it. And each one of us in the class needs to figure out how we're going to find our own balance. And that's why we need powerhouses <laughs> like Zabara what, to I sign me up. <laughs> Erin, I watched the video of your smicha, which was very moving. And one of the things that struck me was not only um, the cheering, but that <laughs> it was, we heard your children's voices in the audience. Like, mommy, mommy, you know? And mommy was up there. Mommy was in the pulpit. Mommy was becoming a rabbi. And you said in your speech, today feels momentous, so full and so fraught. Mm. So I just wondered about the fraught part. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, where to begin? Well, first, let me just go back and say that at the time I had um, two sons and um, they were confused about where the men were on the pulpit. They thought it was unfair that there were only women and um, that, that How felt- How far we've come. Exactly, that felt like a moment to celebrate. Um, they also have a father who's a rabbi now, or was then, I suppose, but they really wondered um, why, yeah, where, where, the, where the men and boys were. Um, in terms of fraught, <laughs> well, I think it relates to my previous answer. Um, fraught because entering into these conversations, entering into this space of tension that Devorah is talking about, of being a representative of a tradition that I know hurts. I also know that it heals, but I know that it hurts. Hurts who? Hurts women, hurts marginalized people of all kinds. Um, authority is hard. Being a representative of something is hard. Um, and I had, I, I inhabited a, a fairly, I think, unique, maybe not, I don't know, I, I inhabited a, a weird space for some years because I taught at the yeshiva for several years before I actually was ordained by the yeshiva. One of the challenges of starting a new school is that we didn't have uh, many female rabbis to choose from. They had not yet been ordained. So, um, so for many years, I was both in this 
kind of project and also adjacent to it in a way. Um, and taking on the mantle of that leadership felt like I was giving a stamp of approval mm. to some things that I continue to feel to feel uh, my own ambivalence about. Um, and I felt then and feel now the 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 heaviness of uh, being the face of um, a, a gorgeous and problematic tradition. Uh, Sarah, I just want to now catch us up to history. You said on JBS, I guess, over a decade ago, we're living in that history now. We don't know how it's going to mm -hmm. turn out. Now we have 13 years of data. And I remember when I interviewed you, one of the things that struck me is that you kept saying, in a sense, we just need facts on the ground. We have to stop talking about it and just have more women getting smicha, being leaders. And now you have how many people are out there in the Jewish landscape as leaders? Are there 33? No, we have 50 women, oh, almost 50 women wow. out in the field, and we have 50 more coming up through Muzzles the pipe. Amazing. And it, it, the movement it started with has four. happened. We started with that first group of women, and uh, that interview was before they graduated, and we didn't know if they would find jobs. They did, and they, are, uh, they all were placed in pulpits. We are thrilled that our graduates are placed in pulpits, in uh, on university campus, in organizations. You know, our goal isn't only to to place our graduates in Orthodox communities, although some some do work there. Um, and uh, you know, I think that it's there has been a transformation in ter in terms of normalizing the uh, the rabbinate in the Orthodox community. But I don't think that's true across the board. Meaning, I don't. I just want to be clear that we have, a, w there has been a success in terms of opening up new pulpits um, for Orthodox women to be assistant rabbis. Um, there's been success in um, Orthodox women serving as heads of organizations and in education, educational settings and teaching Torah on a high level. Um, what is more complicated is that not every Orthodox community is ready to accept women as their leaders, not e even, even ones that are a little bit more open. Mm. Um, and so every time a woman is sent into a new community, they then have to deal with some of the pushback that I got a few years ago. And, and I, feel, I feel very bad <laughs> about that, meaning I, there's been an opening, but we have to go through the steps of putting facts on the ground and, and normalizing and changing hearts and mind on the ground as we did um, 13 years ago. It starts all over again. And now we have students in London and Australia and France. And so now we're expanding out and trying to put those facts on the ground in the, in the global community we're part of. What um, about the glass ceiling, though, in terms of the, like, where can someone go? Right, and that was the next thing I was going to say. I would say they the get next, the top job. I would say the next challenge that we're dealing with currently is that the, those women who were, who were in pulpits, and they've been there for eight years, seven years, six years, they were, those were assistant positions. They were meant to be three, four, five, six year jobs. And we're trying to figure out what the next iteration is. Now, some have their own pulpits. Rabbanit Dasi Fruchter has started her own community. We have a few other women who have, have done the same thing. Um, Dita Nyman, who is not a, a graduate, also has her own pulpit. Um, but we are thinking right now about how to put those facts on the ground to help the community see women as their head rabbis. We are hatching up a plan to try to figure out how to um, invest in women at a very high level so that they can run their own communities. Um, and then again, the model will be that it will it will be normal to see women as the head rabbi. And as recently as uh, 2018, the Orthodox Union revisited uh, female clergy, and they're still not thrilled about it. They're, they did come some distance because they were valuing women in education leadership roles and embracing Torah learning, it sounds like, in a way they hadn't before. But the language was um, that it's at odds with halakha and masorah still. And I just wonder how deflating or enraging that was for you, whether it was completely expected. Um, you had a quote that said, we're glad they're catching up, which is kind of <laughs> looking at the, at the glass being half full. 
But what was your response to number one, that they had a whole rabbinical council to investigate this and that this was their finding? <laughs> what success? I mean, uh, <laughs> I, no, seriously, I, there, there is a uh, something happening that people were paying attention to. They were dealing with the reality, not only at Maharat, but I think other organizations and institutions and individuals were striving and thirsting for uh, high level leadership, women wanting professional roles in the Jewish community, not only through ordination, but expecting to be paid and seen as a leader. And they were recognizing that and willing to, for the first time, I think, support that movement. Um, I understand that they had to stop short of, of accepting ordination and smicha, um, but they, they didn't fully not accept it either. In other words, uh, if it was really against halakha, which as I said at the beginning, I stand by, it is within the, the realm of Jewish law and orthodox understanding of Jewish law, um, then they would have shut it down and they didn't. And, and also the train has left the station. There's too many women who are in the field already mm -hmm. serving. There's too many community members who have been impacted, who have been inspired, who uh, you know want, want their daughters to follow this trajectory. Um, I have to just say that we have a student now who is, uh, I don't know, Erin, you, you maybe say it better. <laughs> we have a student now who um, was very young when I was, uh, when I got smicha and, and she um, remembers she was too young to sort of be part of the controversy, and so she grew up with the idea of Orthodox women in this position being a little bit more normal. And so her trajectory is, is a little bit different to the older women who still felt like they were fighting for something. She just was following a path that she always knew and thought mm. that she could do, she, she could follow, and, and, and that gives me a lot of joy. And I want to just go to the word now because it's changed quite a bit. And even at this table, we have three different titles. You are Rabbah, Rabbanit, and Rabbi. So I don't know who has the courage to tell me what is the kind of background. Is there debate? Is there tension? Or can anyone choose what they want? Why don't we start with you, Aaron? What did, why did you choose Rabbi? Okay, well, first kind I'll of condensed, which I know is hard right sure, now, I'll just, just for time. I'll briefly say that that as an institution, we do not bestow titles. We, okay. we give smicha or ordination, and women choose their titles in concert with their hiring institutions based on what will work in any given community. Um, my hiring institution was Yeshivat Mahara. <laughs> so um, it wasn't so simple, actually. <laughs> you don't remember that. <laughs> um, I believe I still am the only female member of our team who's chosen rabbi. I felt very strongly about it. Um, I have absolute respect for everybody who has made different choices. Um, but for me personally, I wanted uh, total equity. Mm -hmm. Devorah? <laughs> <laughs> so now you've <laughs> pointed to the one woman at this table who does not have ordination. Mm -hmm. So um, yet. <laughs> um, so, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of its own story, but in terms of the title, so, so the first thing is I, um, probably taught for over 20 years without a title. Um, I was known as Devora. um, every once in a while I had a student who would you call told me. Zlotch. Or Zlotch, <laughs> Which I love. just to completely out myself here. <laughs> That's um, a great nickname. Uh, um, and uh, I one time had a student who called me Rebbe D. I told her that was that was over the line. Um, but um, and occasionally students did refer to me as Rebbe in the same way that uh, you know, sort of that very kind of familiar, playful and respectful um, way of referring to one's teacher. Um, but I didn't have a title. Um, I will just say that a, a few little birdies told me that there are maybe a handful of people who match your scholarship when it comes to, to Talmud. So not even, yeah, not even a few. So I, I'm, I'm saying that as someone, as a reporter, not someone who <laughs> is a fan, uh, separate well, from being a fan. But so you, I mean, you were working without a, a title. I was working for so without long. a title, um, and um, it there was meaning to that. For me, um, perhaps meaning out of necessity, but there was meaning. 
I think it made a difference in terms of the in terms of the types of relationships I could have with students. That that boundary wasn't there. Um, that's very important to me. Um, I think it was also an act of protest. <laughs> um, Sarah's laughing because she knows that that's often the story I tell. You know, no, you got to deal with the fact that I am not a rabbi. You know that I know this amount and that I'm going to teach you. And that look at that, she doesn't have a title. Wait, there's a problem there. Um, and then um, eventually, at a certain point, um, also changing which institutions I was I was teaching at. When I went to YCT, I um, I took on the title of rabbanit. Um, and part, part of that was a realization that I actually felt that I did need a title. I also needed a title if I was going to be teaching men, and all the men had titles. And I chose a title. Am I right that you're the first women, woman to probably to teach? Yeah, there? probably. Yeah. Um, to teach there, yes. To it, teach Orthodox in an Orthodox male yeshiva, probably. <laughs> <laughs> to teach Rabbin Axel Gemara. To there, teach right. right. To teach to teach Talmud right. Um, uh, so, so this is in flux for you a bit. Yeah, I'm always in flux. Um, but um, <laughs> I, <real. laughs> I, I wanted something that that um, that both spoke to the traditional and the not so traditional is really the the short yeah. answer. And Sarah, would you prefer that everyone was uniform? Would that just be simpler? So, I, I, my dream when I started this was that we would all have the same title, and it would be a title that everybody would rally around and understand that this is what Orthodox female rabbis are. Um, I'm very comfortable in describing the job as rabbi and with the title rabbi, but when I started, I felt like there had to be a distinction between the, the I and something else to help people understand that it was Orthodox. Um, and I think that I came around to recognize and realize that, again, winning or success wasn't about everybody having the same title, but we had to let them function and be the rabbis that they were meant to be in the communities in which they belonged. And I, I let go of titles. Um, and I think that I was surprised when we came up with the uh, our policy that the right title would be connected with the community in which they were hired. I made the assumption that that would be um, a less RB sounding title to allow like more conservative with a lowercase c uh, communities hire a woman. And that is what happened. There were some that couldn't even handle the Maharat title initially, and they needed that opening in order to hire uh, our women, our graduates. Um, and so it took me by surprise when the first student wanted to be rabbi, um, which was p totally aligned with the policy, actually. Um, but I, I have come around. I'm proud that we have graduates who are rabbi, rabbi, rabbani, other titles, maharat, um, because, because they're all functioning and serving and, and doing what doing they the dreamed about doing, and, and that, that's enough. So I'd love the final round to just be what's left to, to climb. Um, if you can think about, I know these are, this would normally be a, a much longer conversation, but when you either lose sleep at night or things kind of get your blood going of like, I can't believe we're still, we still X, we still Y. Um, and I guess I want to start with you, Devorah. You, you said in a speech uh, that I loved when you talked about your boys, that they are often the ones who challenge you. Um, and that they ask you, how can you still sit on one side of a mechitza? How can you not be counted in a minion? Um, even going so far, your quote is saying, be a second class citizen, which I thought was really powerful and hard. So I, I wonder how you answer your sons. Maybe that's a way to start, if, if you're willing, of what's left to do. That wasn't what I was going to say, but now that you put it out there, I can't. Um um, avoid that. Um, I have uh, two boys who keep me very honest um, in <laughs> case there was a moment in which I wasn't <laughs> doing that to myself. Um, I get that from them. Um, there's something very beautiful and incredible about that. Um, um, and they really celebrate me and I and they push me, which is um, you know, that's that's, that's really a privilege to, mm. to be pushed by my children um, and to think really hard about what it is that I'm accepting and to be able to give an answer that's justifiable to a millennial, right? Who, uh, <laughs> who, 
who have, you know, very different life experiences than I. They grew up in my home, right? They didn't grow up in the, in the home in the community in which I grew up. Um, I haven't changed what I do, and these are questions I've asked myself for many, many, many years. Um, so it, it kind of reminds me to keep on reflecting on it and to, and to be, you know, to be flexible and to be fluid about it. Um, but my dream or the thing that keeps me up at night is, is, is opportunities for learning, is about um, women still not having the same access, girls not having the same access, um, yeshivot from men still being so fundamentally different than yeshivot for women. Um, the cultural expectations being so different. And I really believe that, that so much starts with culture and so much starts with expectations. If, if our boys get the explicit or implicit message that one is supposed to grow up to be a Talmud scholar and the world is open to do that and our girls don't, then, then, very different paths. then it's very different paths. Thank you. Erin. When we began 13 years ago, um, I understood then, as I understand now, that not only were we trying to graduate students, but we were trying to graduate communities in which they could be, in which they could serve. Mm. Um, and I think we just have a lot of work still to be done um, in community building and in um, helping to educate the Orthodox world, the wider, the Jew. The wider Jewish world seems to have gotten it, but the, the Orthodox world um, itself still has a ways to go in, in really empowering, empowering women. So I'm delighted by our growth and our numbers, um, and I'd very much like to see us be generating worldwide, which we are right now, um, much greater receptivity to the world that we are envisioning and building. Okay. Sarah, the last word. Um, I think that the women who are out in the field are creating a real impact. They have authority and I want them to have even more authority. And so I think the next iteration is um, helping women with issues on divorce and marriage, um, which are really naughty, could be really naughty, halachic Jewish law, have Jewish law consequences. And um, I want them to be experts in the resources in the Jewish law and how to pastorally really help and move the needle on what's a really painful issue. Um, and, and I think that taking women who learn on a high level and giving them even more expertise in certain areas is, is what we're trying to do by creating compassionate leaders who are trying to make a difference in the world. Thank you. Thank you all for your leadership, for your courage, for charting a path that isn't easy, but I think most of us agree is essential. And I want to thank the JBS family for uh, another edition of In the Spotlight. I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Abby. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut 06904. Or you can call the JBS pledge line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.